one of the key claims that Messianic Judaism makes is that Jewish followers of Jesus have a covenantal responsibility to live as Jews continuing to observe the Torah. Whether you look at the Gospels or Paul's letters, this is what the New Testament teaches. And one of the key biblical texts we would use to show this is Jesus' statement in Matthew 5, verse 17, where he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And I would argue that in this text, Jesus claims that Jewish followers of Jesus are still expected to observe the Torah. And I found it interesting that Rabbi Tovia Singer has a video where he offers a radically different perspective. And just listen to what he has to say on this issue. Out of context, Matthew appears to be supporting the notion that you must keep the law. That's what it appears to be. But that's not the case. If you keep reading the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see there is what is being set up is that um, you have heard what I say unto you. You have heard that um, if you uh, feel uh, covetedness towards uh, a woman and you feel you're already um, feeling the sin in your heart for adultery, you've already committed adultery. But in classical Jewish thinking, it's really very much the reverse. If you are, if you are tempted and say, I would, she's very attractive, or this, he's a very handsome fellow, and I would like to sin. But the God of Israel commanded me not to, and therefore I will not. That person is considered righteous. If you have a man and a woman who live on a deserted island, and there's no other people on that island, and they spend their entire lives never encountering another human being, could we really say of that man and woman that they're, they were faithful to each other and virtuous for that reason? The answer is no, there was no temptation. So the virtue is born out of temptation. So it really is a, a classic clash in, in the Christian thinking. If you feel tempted, you've already done it. It's as if you've done it. So therefore, if that is the case, then in fact, we, there's none, no one can keep the Torah. The Sermon on the Mount is mistakenly thought of or seen as by Christian scholars as uh, condoning uh, keeping the law. It, it is not. It is actually setting, taking the law and then and then, um, and then changing the voltage on it and the, the message on it to make it impossible to keep it. And once you have that in place, well, then the only possible way out of this is through Jesus. And that's what the Sermon Mount really is very, very much about. This is an effort to explain uh, why mankind is lost. But you have to hike it up and say the temptation itself is the sin. Well, once if the temptation is already the sin, then none of us could... Well, it's true. That's why Torah never says such a thing. Before addressing Rabbi Singer's specific reading of Matthew 5, verses 27 through 28, let's step back and read the context of the passage, starting in verse 17, where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law, until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, speaking to his Jewish audience, says that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. So the first question we need to ask is, what does this word abolish mean? What is this? What does it mean that he has not come to abolish the Torah? Well, the literal meaning of this Greek word often translated as abolish is katalusai, which is to unyoke. New Testament scholar Dr. Craig Keener, he points out that Jesus is saying he did not come to, quote, cast off the Torah's yoke. So in this statement, it's similar to how the rabbinic literature speaks of putting on the yoke of the Torah. In the Babylonian Talmud in Berachot 14b, it says, Why did the portion of Shema precede that of Vahaya im Shemoa, so that one will first accept upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, and only then accept upon himself the yoke of the mitzvot, the commandments. 
In modern terms, Jesus is saying that he has not come to unhitch the Torah from the life of his Jewish disciples. And the text says that he has come to fulfill the Torah. So what does this mean? Well, the Greek word used here is plerosai, which means to fill up, to fill to the full. Again, Jesus clarifies that he has not come to cast off the yoke of the Torah from his Jewish disciples. And verse 18 through 20 is specifically about keeping the commandments. So the fulfill in some way has to do with these commandments. And interestingly enough, the same Greek word translated as fulfill, plerosa here, is also used in Matthew 3 verse 15, which says, But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. This text communicates Jesus' goal to fulfill God's will. So given this use of the word, the context of Matthew 5 verse 17, as a discussion of keeping the commandments, and what unfolds in Jesus' sermon, I think my friend Ben, who is a graduate student pursuing a master's in rabbinic studies, I think he communicates Yeshua's words here fulfill best. When he says, what Yeshua is saying is that he came to bring the observance of Torah to its fullness, to get to the heart of what it means to follow the Torah. This is similar to what Jewish scholar Dr. Amy Jill Levine says. She says Jesus signals that he is drawing out the Torah's full implications. And Jesus goes on to explain that if a Jew chooses to follow Yeshua and they do not observe the Torah and teach others to break it as well, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But if they obey it and teach others to also obey it, they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And again, according to Dr. Levine, she says Jesus is telling his followers to be a disciple means to follow Torah. And it means, therefore, to follow Jesus' Torah instructions. If the disciple doesn't bear good fruits, then the system doesn't work. Now, I want to be clear. Jesus' instruction to observe the Torah is to his Jewish followers. Gentiles were never expected to be Torah observant. So, while they are free to participate in Jewish ways of life and worship, they are not obligated to be circumcised, keep kosher, or observe Shabbat. However, the specific commands in question that I'm discussing in this video concern adultery and lusting, both of which apply to both Jew and Gentile followers of Jesus. And with that in mind, let's continue. Reading Matthew 5, verse 17 through 20 is absolutely essential for understanding Matthew 5, verse 27 through 28. Jesus brilliantly anticipates that people will misunderstand his darash, his teaching on the Torah, as Rabbi Tovia Singer does in this video. And essentially, verses 17 through 20 is Jesus communicating to his audience that he has not come to unhitch the Torah from the lives of his Jewish disciples. So according to Jesus, these Jewish disciples who have already placed their trust in Jesus must keep the Torah. But I can see where Rabbi Singer and many other people get confused. Again, listen to what he says. What is being set up is that um, you have heard but I say unto you. So it appears that Jesus is about to contradict the Torah. But again, it takes some linguistic and contextual information to see what Jesus is doing here. Linguistically, New Testament scholar Dr. Craig Keener, he points out that the Greek word choice in Matthew 5 is important to highlight. The word translated as but is de, which often means an. In other words, it doesn't necessarily imply a strong contrast. By remembering Jesus' clear guiding statement in verse 17, we know that he is not going to contradict the Torah. He is about to get at the heart of what it means to follow the Torah. Day does not disrupt Jesus' clear statement. However, I do want to make you aware of one exception, where Jesus is contradicting something that is often mistaken as coming from the Torah. And this is in Matthew 5, verse 43 through 44, which says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There is no passage in the Torah that says to hate your enemies. But this was an idea that was present in Second Temple Judaism, and it could be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1 QS 9.21. Here Jesus is saying that the heart of following the command in the Torah to love one's neighbor 
is even to love one's enemies. So what Jesus is doing when he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, he's doing what other rabbis do. He's building a fence around the Torah for his disciples. The purpose of a fence is to protect what lies inside. And what Jesus and other rabbis of his time would do is they would prevent their disciples from breaking a certain commandment by offering rulings to make breaking that commandment even more difficult. So let's look at how Jesus does this in Matthew 5, verse 27 through 28. This is what the text says. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, Rabbi Singer says, In the Christian thinking, if you feel tempted, you've already done it. It's as if you've done it. So therefore, if that is the case, then in fact, we, there's none, no one can keep the Torah. So we already know that Rabbi Singer is wrong because by telling his Jewish followers that he did not come to abolish the Torah, that it must be followed, he is saying that the Torah can be kept. Therefore, whatever Jesus is communicating here is not what Rabbi Singer is offering. But this raises the question, what is Jesus saying? Let me present what I think is a plausible reading offered by Dr. Jason Staples. He's a historian of early Judaism and Christianity who teaches at North Carolina State University. Dr. Staples points out that the Greek word usually translated as lust in this passage is epithomeo, which is exactly the word used for covet in the 10th commandment found in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh. So let's read the passage. You will not covet your neighbor's wife. You will not covet your neighbor's house or his field or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or any animal which is your neighbor's. In Greek, the word translated as wife, gune, is the same word translated in Matthew as woman, Matthew 5 verse 28. So Dr. Staples argues that Jesus is not saying anything new. This is what he says. Jesus directly cites one of the Ten Commands to remind his audience that the law not only prohibits adultery, it prohibits coveting with the same severity. That is not an intensification of the law, it's a reminder of what the law already says. In addition, Jesus gives no indication that he regards the law as too difficult to keep. He not only assumes that his followers can follow his interpretation of the Torah, but commands them to do so. So what does coveting mean in the 10th commandment? Staples points out that both verbs in the Hebrew, chamad and the Greek word epithomeo, denote desire directed at obtaining the specific object in question and not merely the existence of the desire itself. He goes on to say that this command is perhaps best understood as forbidding fixing one's desire upon obtaining something that is not rightfully one's own. The word lust in Greek, epithomia, in the New Testament period was not understood as an exclusively sexual term. As Dr. Staples points out, it simply refers to a strong, passionate desire used either for sexual desire or for strong desire for something non-sexual. We actually find the different uses in the New Testament itself. So let's look at Jesus' words in the following passages. Luke 22:15. And he said to them, I have lusted to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Matthew 13, verse 17. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men lusted to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Luke 15, verse 16. And the prodigal lusted to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. With all this in mind, let's look at the verses in question, and more specifically, let's look at the grammar. Dr. Staples explains this more in his blog post, which I'll link in the description below, but essentially he argues that the Greek preposition pros in verse 28 indicates purpose, and he provides four other examples where Matthew also uses pros with the same grammatical construction. So let's look at Staples' translation of these four passages as he emphasizes how pros is being used to reflect the purpose of the action. Matthew 6 verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. Matthew 13 verse 30, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles in order to burn them up. Matthew 23 verse 5, 
But they do all their deeds in order to be noticed by them, for they brought in their phylacteries and lengthened the tassels of their garments. Matthew 26, verse 12, For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it in order to prepare me for burial. Because the Greek word pros in Matthew 5, 28 is used to indicate purpose, Dr. Staples translates the text this way, Anyone who looks at a woman in order to covet her, he uses the word covet instead of lust because covet better communicates the intentionality reflected in the passage. Dr. Staples explains, This is a critically important point. Jesus is not suggesting that any sexual thought or inclination towards a woman is sinful, nor is he suggesting that such thoughts or attractions being triggered by a look are sinful. The look is not the problem nor is the presence of a beautiful woman, which some of that day tended to blame as the real problem. No, these are assumed. What is remarkable, given the popular misinterpretation, is that Jesus likewise assumes the presence of sexual desire in the man as a given, and that sexual desire isn't seen as the problem. Instead, Jesus addresses the matter of intent, of volition, the purpose of the look. The issue is not the appetite itself, but how a man directs this natural appetite and inclination. I'm reminded here of the old saying, if you're a young man on a beach and a beautiful woman in a bikini walks past and you don't notice, it's not because you're spiritual, it's because you're dead. Dr. Staples' reading makes sense within the context of Jesus' sermon. Yeshua is pointing out the root causes of various sins prohibited in the Torah, when a man fixes his desire on sleeping with the woman who is not his wife, he is coveting her, breaking the tenth commandment. As Dr. Staples says, adultery has already polluted the heart. This is the line between natural sexual attraction and the coveting prohibited by the law. The law forbids directing one's desire towards that which is not lawful. Jesus does not condemn the desire, but the action taken on the desire. I want to be clear here. What is forbidden is fixing one's desire on one who is not your spouse, whether people online or in person. So yes, if, a, if you're a human, you will feel attraction. That's how God created us. The question Yeshua is addressing is what will you do with that feeling? Going back to Rabbi Singer, he says, in the Christian thinking, if you feel tempted, you've already done it. But Rabbi Singer is misunderstanding Jesus in Matthew 5. It's not the feeling of temptation that is prohibited. It is a man coveting a woman who is not his wife that is prohibited, and vice versa. It's about the will of a person's heart, not the natural feelings all humans experience. And Yeshua is not saying anything new here. He points back to the 10th commandment and explains why breaking that commandment is the first step to committing adultery, and the way to avoid breaking this 7th commandment is by not breaking the 10th commandment found in the Torah. I think Dr. Staples' reading of Matthew 5, verse 27 through 28 is a responsible and accurate one, and it lines up well with what I brought up at the beginning of the video, this Jewish concept of building a fence around the Torah. Jesus builds a fence around the command not to commit adultery by reminding his audience to obey the 10th commandment, do not covet. So contrary to what Rabbi Tovia Singer is telling us, in Matthew 5, Jesus is not showing us the Torah is impossible to keep. He is revealing what he expects from his disciples, those who have already placed their trust in him. So now I want to ask you, do you think Rabbi Singer's view is right? That Jesus is saying the sin is the temptation, and his point is that the Torah is impossible to keep? Or do you agree with Dr. Staples' argument that Jesus is saying the sin is coveting a woman who is not your wife, and he expects his followers not to do this? Let me know in the comments below. If you're on YouTube and you found this video helpful or challenging, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for updates on future videos. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe. Thank you for joining me and see you next time. Thank you.